Oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I, I appreciate the honor of being here. And, um, you know, going around and uh, seeing different places that I have the privilege of, uh, of seeing, um, I'm just, just happy, and, happy and blessed with uh, what we have here in this house. And when I look around, the thing that I think about more than anything is freedom. It is a freedom and a peace in this house that doesn't exist in very many places. Uh, a freedom where the Spirit of God can move and rule and reign and really touch people's lives because that's the heart of this house. The heart of this house isn't to uh, grow in, in numbers into a mega church or bring more money in or, or, or change the face of the church and give it a facelift. That's not the focus. The focus here is people and seeing the Spirit of God, the power of God, the Word of God change people's lives. And I'm glad to be part of a place like that. Uh, thankful for Pastor Paul. He, I call him the sermonator. He can absolutely, I believe he could take the word behold and teach a 16-week series and have it different every single time and feed us. Amen. But I'm thankful, Pastor Andy. Thank you so much for allowing me to minister today. And uh, I was set up today, set up today. I was going to preach on um, flags and banners and uh, last night, as I was studying that, God kind of started taking me to a, a, through a different um, path, and now I, I, I know why. We're, Genesis chapter 37 is where we're going to start. And I want to minister to you today on the thought that Reuben threw me in, but Judah got me out. Reuben threw me in, but Judah got me out. Genesis chapter 37, starting at verse 18. I'll be in the New King James Version. <clears throat> Genesis 37 and 18. The Bible says, Now when they saw him, speaking about Joseph here, it says, Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let's not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness. And do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of the hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat meal and they lifted their eyes and looked and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt." And when you look at Joseph, and if you've studied the story of Joseph, Joseph looks like a young man that's got it all going on. He is the guy that I would have wanted to have been up until this point, up until this turnaround. He was born, he was the favorite of the father. He was absolutely the favorite of the father, but he wasn't the favorite of the father because he had the coat. He had the coat because he was the favorite of the father. Complete different thing. The father marked him as special. The father marked him as unique so that everywhere he went, everyone knew he was the beloved of the father. Everyone knew that he was the favorite. And isn't it amazing, the Psalms tells us that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Sometimes when God puts a favor on you, your friends don't like it. Sometimes church folk don't like it. Sometimes family doesn't like it, and definitely your enemies never like it, but there was a favor put on Joseph, and it seemed like he had his stuff together, and he was the man. Until that dream, that vision, that calling on his life got people so bad that Reuben decides, what we're going to do is I'm going to take him, and I'm going to throw him into a pit. 
Now, at some point in your life, you will face a pit situation. And sometimes you're in a pit not because you jumped into a pit. Sometimes you're in a pit because you did go into a pit. Sometimes you're in a pit just because life happens. If, if you have been born again and someone ever told you that you'll never deal or none of your family will ever deal with sickness, they have lied to you. If you're born again and someone said as a Christian you'll never lose your job and you're always going to have enough money to pay all your bills and everything else, you're never going to struggle, you're never going to have any troubles, you're never going to have any trials. If someone has told you that, they have lied to you. Every one of us will have a pit. How in the world else can our faith be tried and worked and grow if there is no pit? There will always be a pit. The Bible says in Psalm 34, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. There will be a pit in your life. The thing that concerns me and the thing that should concern you is this. In this pit, if you choose to stay in the pit long enough, you will die there. If you keep your dream in the pit long enough, your dream will die there. If you leave your calling in the pit for too long, your calling, your anointing, your position will die there. Oh, come on, if you leave your marriage in the pit too long, your marriage will die there. I know some of us didn't ask for the divorce. I know some of us didn't ask for the job loss. I know some of us didn't ask for that. Some, some of us, because we stayed in the pit too long, lost it. But some people had a Reuben in their life that, that shoved you into the pit for something that you never deserved. Sometimes life isn't fair. Sometimes there's a pit with your name on it when everything's going good, Job. Sometimes, sometimes, you're, you, sometimes you walk through life and a Job situation happens to you. Listen, you had the foundation. You were rolling with that thing, man. You were hitting your ministry. You're, you were wealthy. Everything was going good in your life. And all of a sudden, the sickness came and crippled you and brought you down to your knees. But the Bible, let me remind you, the Bible says though a righteous man falls seven times, he always gets back up. You were not anointed to be someone that lives in the pit. You have an anointing on your life that is supposed to bring you up out of a pit. You're never supposed to stay in a pit. And what happens is, as I understand, man, because I've been here, I'll go ahead and let you know, I have been in a pit and I have been a baby about it at times. I have laid there before until I've almost lost a marriage. Don't look at me religious. I have laid there before until I almost lost my calling. I have laid there before until everything that I have value was almost taken away from me because I chose to stay in the pit instead of get up out of the pit because in the pit, I'm just laying there helpless. No doubt Joseph was sitting there in that pit. Somebody help me. I don't deserve this to happen to my life. Do you not see the coat that's on my life? I've always been favored. Somebody just get me. I'll do anything if you just get me out of this mess. I'll do it. Don't leave me here. I'm in a pit. I've never been like this before. And the longer you stay in there, the more depression tries to creep in on your life. And now you begin to give your ear not to the Father but to the enemy who whispers that you are nobody and you have no value and you have no worth attached to your life. And as we begin to do that, you begin to say, my marriage will never overcome. My health will never get any better. My finances will never increase. I'll never have the blessing of the Lord because you're just in that pit. I tried, I asked for help, and they wouldn't help me. Come on, that's a word right there. See, when we're in the pits, we, 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 need some, we want someone to come automatically to our rescue and just pick us up and pluck us up and make everything okay. But sometimes people can't be there deep enough before the pit that I'm in how deep it is. Sometimes that pit's way deeper than what you can do for me, Adam. Sometimes that pit, if all of y'all banded together and, and, and you all reached at the same time, sometimes I have been in a pit so deep that you couldn't reach me even if you wanted to reach me. And the longer you're in there and the deeper you're in the pit, the darker it gets all around you. You begin to, to, to if one of the most, I think, horrible things that could happen would be if you were just locked away in solitary confinement. Just there all by yourself. You can't hear anybody anymore. And so your mind just begins to play tricks with you and tell you everything that you're not and tell you ever how bad it's going to be. 
Nothing's ever going to get any better. That is the place where Joseph was, but Joseph was never anointed to be placed in a pit. Joseph was anointed to be head over a palace. He was a dreamer. His dream, his dream would make room for him, but in the process, there was a Reuben in his life that said, I don't want you to get to that dream. Sometimes people don't want you to walk out their dream because they're too selfish and want to sit back on their laurels and not do anything with their life. So they don't really mind you getting there. It's just that when they're associated with you, it shows that they're not really doing anything with their life, so they're trying to bring you down to their level instead of trying to help you get to where God's called you to be. That's what was wrong because they were all sons. They all had a part of the inheritance. Matter of fact, Joseph couldn't have even touched the inheritance because he wasn't the firstborn. There were people that outranked him in the family. But because of favor, Reuben throws him in the pit. And I'm telling you that if you and I stay in the pit for way too long, we're going to be in a mess. Now listen to this. Reuben comes back in the next verse. We didn't read it. But Reuben comes back and he tries to find Joseph in the pit. He doesn't know anything about Joseph being pulled out of this pit. He's actually surprised and he comes back. Reuben comes back and he looks down in the pit and all he sees is a bloody garment. He says, oh my goodness, my brother must have died. Friend, I want to tell you this. Sometimes the people that push you in the pit are an enemy over your life. And they'll come back to the last place that they found you where they push you in and they'll look for you to be in the same place that they left you. They'll look for you to still be in the same bar that you came out of. They'll look for you to still be in the same mess that you're in. They'll look to see that same, that same syringe in the vein of your arm. They'll try to come back and find you in the exact same mess that you were in. But this time when Reuben came back, Joseph wasn't there. And I came to tell somebody today that when the enemy comes back again, this has gone on for far too long in your life. And when the enemy comes back to look down in your pit and to mock you, you don't have to be there. Judah can get you up out of your mess. Reuben walks up to this situation and he says there, where is my brother? My goodness, I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the things in my life, the enemy continuing to come and come and come and come and bring back old things that, that God has already taken off of my life. Keeps coming back to the pit, trying to keep me in the pit. But Joseph was no longer in the pit. Joseph was no longer in the pit. Joseph wasn't the only one that was ever in a pit. David was in a pit. David said this. David said that God brought me up out of the miry clay and set my feet on a solid and firm foundation and established my goings. The prophet Jeremiah the Bible says there's a story there about the prophet Jeremiah when, when he was thrown down into a dungeon. And it says that he was crying and screaming for help to get up out of that dungeon. And it says that the men came and they said, we don't have anything new, but we've got some old rags. If you'll take the old rags and tie them around the ropes and put them up under your armpits and just hang on to the rope, we can begin to pull you up out of that thing. And those old things brought him up out of there. I am thankful for the progression of God. I am thankful that, that I am thankful for technology. I'm thankful for indoor bathrooms and I'm thankful for new lighting and sounds and stage and fog machines. I love those things, man. It's exciting. It really focuses you in. But there's sometimes there are things in our life where we gotta go back and we gotta begin to pull up some old garments and begin to tie them together again if they're ever gonna pull us out of a pit. And one of the things that does not change in the life of a believer is that your praise will elevate you from the pit to the palace. Your praise will take you from right where you are to where he's called you to be. Amen. And I have a problem a lot of times in a praise service because of, it. well, really it's probably pride. It got quiet again. <laughs> It probably is because if I dance before the Lord in front of you, what will you think of me? If I shout too loud, what will they say about me? But I, I, I would like to get to a place to where we get to a place of praise 
where the pain is so great that I realize my praise has got to be greater and I see mascara running on your face sometime. Sometime you might need to get your hair messed a little bit, uh, up a little bit. Nah, I know you got your Payless pumps on today and we look all nice and we look all pretty. But God doesn't care if the praise is ugly. Your praise doesn't have to be pretty in order to be powerful. Did you hear me? Your praise does not have to be pretty in order to be powerful. God's just looking for a praise. He doesn't care what it looks like. He doesn't care what form or fashion it comes in. He doesn't care if you're skinny and have abs or if you're big like me and don't. <laughs> He's just looking for someone to say, today, in order to get out of my pit, I need to praise you. Praise, I'm talking about ugly praise. It's ugly praise, man. When Joseph is in that pit, there was nothing pretty about that thing. He's in the pit. His life is over. He's abandoned. He's laying there. It feels like he's about ready to die. In fact, that they've told him that he will die there. And all he begins to do is just, I can't do this on my own. Somebody help me. That's praise. I can't get out of this mess by myself, but I need someone who can get me out to come down into my situation. I can't do it on my own. I am killing my pride. I'm killing myself and realizing I can't make it tomorrow unless someone comes down from another world into my situation and lifts me up out of my pit. I'm talking about an ugly praise. He was already stripped of his garment. He was already stripped of his kingly, his favor robe. He was already taken off of him. And he's laying down there sweating and crying and bleeding and everything else. Saying, I can't get out of this mess unless someone comes down and rescues me. I can't make it to where I'm supposed to be unless someone comes down and gets me out of my mess. But the reality is, as you and I have got to know this and believe and be honest with ourselves and realize an area of our life that is in a pit. If you don't realize the area of your life that's in the pit, you can't praise yourself out of that pit. And let me tell you what happens with your praise. Your praise is not determined by what everyone else thinks. And that's what I'm trying to get in my soul. I'm trying to change my mind on it. I am. I'm, I'm trying to get myself. At some point, I'm just going to have to go ahead and I guess jump on over into whatever. You, you see what I'm saying? It's hard. It's that, it's that soul thing that's going on right now. Well, what do people think? What's going to happen? Where am I going to go? They'll laugh at me. I'll look stupid. I'll look dumb. But if you knew how deep my pit was, I wouldn't care about what your opinion is because my praise has got to be bigger than my pit. And, and whether you think I look silly or you think I look ugly or you think I look dumb, none of that really matters because I know how deep my pit is and I know where he's brought me from. So if I know how deep my pit is and I know where he's brought me from, I know how big my praise has to be. You and I cannot determine the troubles and the trials that come in our life. We don't get to choose. Ain't no one in here that's ever had cancer that chose it. Ain't no one in here that's ever lost a job that chose it. There's no one in here that's ever completely lost your family that sat there and said, you know what, I hope I just don't have a family tomorrow. You can't choose your trial. You can't choose your circumstance. You can't choose your situation. But you can choose your praise. You can't choose the pit that you're in, but you can choose the praise that's going to bring you out. You and I don't get to choose what's going to happen and what kind of curveball is going to be thrown at me tomorrow, but I can choose whether or not I stand there and let that thing take me out and keep me in a pit, or if I say, today I choose, I'm not going to stay in this pit not one more day. At some point, you've got to begin to look at your neighbor and look at your family and look at your wife and look at your kids and say, as for me and my house, I refuse to stay in this pit one more day. The mess comes. You decide whether you're staying in the pit. You decide whether you're getting out. And you know that's really why people don't like pastor when he preaches. It's not because he's not a good pastor. Pastor puts a lot of responsibility on us. Come on, he teaches us. Right? He does. He, he, you know why? Because he can't always be there. 
It's his job to teach me and to download things onto me. Why? Because he wants me to rule and reign in life, not through Pastor Paul, but through me, through God. That's why. That's why a lot of people don't like him. They say he's too hard. Why? Because he realizes that he puts responsibility on, 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 on us to walk out the word. That's what I'm saying to you now. <laughs> It doesn't matter how big the pit is. It doesn't matter how deep and dark it is. You can't change any of that. What you can change and what you can control is your praise. That's what you can control. Look here with me in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 20. King David. Man, I love reading after King David. Because the Bible announces him as the man after God's own heart. And he messed up a whole lot. How many people know that you're still a human? He's still going to make mistakes. You're still going to fumble the ball. You're still going to mess up. Hello. (laughs) We are. There are some days that I am not. If you catch me at the wrong moment, you will think I'm splitting hell wide open. Why? Because I hate traffic too. But David's awesome, man. Because David was a man after God's own heart, not because of his actions, but because of his praise. He was a man after God's own heart, not because of his pedigree, but because of his praise. He was always quick to go back and say, listen, I was a real big fool on that one. But glory to God, you are the the lifter of my head. (laughs) He pinned that. Glory to God, you took me out of the miry clay and set my feet on a solid rock and established my going. Praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's why David was a man after God's own heart. Look here, look here. 2 Samuel 6 and 20. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids and his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David and Machiel said, It was before the Lord you chose me instead of your father and all this house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. So this is what happens. So David goes down and he knows what it is to be in the presence of God. I've been there, so have you. You've experienced the presence of God. Yes, God's always in me. Yes, I'm always filled with the Holy Spirit, of course. But there are times, you know what I'm talking about, where there's an atmosphere in your life where he just covers you up. I mean, it is a tangible anointing. You've been there. That's what David was after. David was after an experience with him. And he goes after in the ark of God, which represents all of God's presence, all of God's power, all of God's authority. The ark of God had been stolen. David goes down, he gets it back. And it says there that on the way back that he began to dance before the Lord and he began to take off his clothes. Why did he take off his clothes? Not as a sign of disrespect, but because David was a king. And David said, today you and I cannot both be kings, but if I'll strip myself of my kingly garments, I will be a priest today before the Lord. Sometimes we got to take off our, our cloak sometimes of who we think we are and how bad we think we are. Sometimes we got to realize, yes, I'm a king, but I'm also a priest unto the Lord. And sometimes God needs me to be a king on earth and rule and reign for him. And sometimes he needs me to be a priest on earth and go minister to him. 
And so David stands there, and it says the whole way back, David is dancing and twirling and, and jumping and out of breath and just, man, you would think that boy had absolutely lost his mind. And his wife gets, gets mad. Wow, that's been happening all the way since Bible times. <laughs> She gets mad at him and she says, why in the world are you doing this in front of the people? She didn't care that he was doing it and looking like a fool on his own, but he did it in front of the people. You're trying to make me look bad. She was embarrassed of his praise. She was embarrassed. Uh, can, can, well, can I tell you people that have a problem with praisers actually have a problem with praise? People that have a problem with true praisers really don't have a problem with the praisers. They got a problem with the praise because they got a problem with the pride and they got a problem with the shame. That's really the issue. The issue really isn't you and I, anyhow. The issue is themselves. And she stands there and she begins to jump all over him. And I love his response. I love his response. Because he looks at her and he says, Honey, what you don't understand is this isn't about you. This is about the God who called me long before you ever showed up. This is about a God that anointed me, who chose me to be a ruler and a king over Israel. This isn't about you anyhow. This is about a God who reached down into my life when a bear was about to kill me and a lion was about to kill me and a giant was about to kill me and he reached down and he grabbed me and he brought me through that mess. This isn't about you anyhow. This is, about a, this is about a guy who nobody liked, about a guy who always sat on the back burner, and a God who found uh, someone that he could use. It is about a God who reached out in my life and saved me from your daddy that was trying to kill me anyhow. And you think for one second that you're going to be able to determine the level of praise that I have? Honey, you have, you have absolutely picked the wrong guy. Nah. Tammy, can you come play for me? I'm going to wrap this up. As he was dancing, he looks at her, and this is what he says. He says, I know you've been embarrassed today. Now, I'm just, this is the King Jimmy version. I know I've embarrassed you and I know I haven't lived up to your standards and I know I'm not up to par and I know you don't like what I'm doing and I know you think I've lost my mind and I know all the negative stuff. I know all the negative stuff that you think about me. But I got news for you. What you saw today, dear, tomorrow when you see me, it's going to be even more undignified because you see today I was tired because I had to praise him all the way back with the ark of God and if, if I can just go to bed and get me a little bit of sleep tonight if you see me tomorrow ha, what you saw today is nothing like what you'll see me doing tomorrow it's going to be even more undignified than this ha, I'm taking it to another level let me get a little fresh breath of God up in my life the next time you see me Oh, you may have seen me do the little hop today, but maybe in a week you'll see me running. And maybe the week after that you might see me flip-flopping and everything. Who knows what we're going to do? And it's not about the action. It's about the reaction. It's not about the thing you do. It's about the one he is. David said here, listen, listen, listen. It says David, David continued to play. He continued to play. Look that word up, play right there. That word does not mean he played an instrument like Tammy is doing right now. It means playing like a child who before your father. <laughs> it means when my little boy, the moment I walk in the door, I don't know how it is at your house, but the moment the dad walks in the door, no matter how bad my day's been, my world has just completely changed. Because I walk in my home and I hear, Daddy! 
and I hear little feet. He's falling, walking to me. She's tripping over him. They look like a mess. They got dirt all over him. They got chocolate strung from their hair all the way down to their feet. There's some rough looking kids. But because they're crying out for daddy, no matter how much junk they've got on their life, daddy reaches down in my shirt and tie pick them up because they're chasing after daddy. They don't want anything. They don't ask me for their allowance when, they, when I come home. They don't ask me to help them with the room or take them to the pool. They come home, they just want daddy. They're a mess. None of y'all would kiss my kids if y'all saw what they look like some days when I get home. That is the most beautiful sight these eyes have ever seen. And when they want me, I will lose my life to reach them. I would do anything. They better not listen to the tape because in that moment, if they ask me for anything, I'm like putty in their hands, man. That's what it's like. When is the last time you have stood in the presence of your Father and just played in His presence? Listen to me. Uh, When He came to you and saw you in your pit, He didn't care about your addiction. He didn't care about how ugly your life was. He didn't care about the mess that you were in. He just hurt my God. Can you just remember, take yourself back to the night when you were in your pit and you didn't have anything else you could say, but my God, somebody come rescue me. And he came. (laughs) He kicked down doors. They never wanted you. They, They passed you around from man to man and woman to woman and everything else. They're not your husbands either. And then she says, but come meet a man. Come meet a man who reached past the flesh, who reached past my mess, who reached past everything that you all see bad than me. He looked past that and he saw life. He saw love. He saw someone in a pit that was reaching out for help. It was ugly and it wasn't pretty. But praise will attract the Father right down there in your mess. We just got to realize that there's a pit and you are not anointed to stay in that pit. You are the head and not the tail. You are above only and never beneath. You are blessed when you go in. You are blessed when you come out. Everything your hand touches is blessed. Everywhere your feet walk are blessed. Your children are blessed. Your home is blessed. Your body is blessed. With his stripes, you are healed. Stop begging him and start praising him. Reuben threw you in with that stroke. Reuben threw you in with that doctor's report. Reuben threw you in with that mess. But your praise will bring you out of your pit. Your praise will bring you out of your pit. Stand to your feet this morning. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, He loves you and there is nothing more that you have to do to be accepted by the Beloved. Not one more thing that you have to do. And all He's asking you to do is, will you allow me to pull you up out of your pit. But if you're here today and listen, you're a believer and you have been in a pit, I believe that today is the first day of the rest of your life. I believe today God is going to pull some people up out of the pit of their mess. He never called you to be there. You will leave this house today still in the pit only if you choose to still be in the pit. Why? Because the anointing is burden removing. It is yoke destroying. So who am I talking to today? 
we want to pray with you this morning. Listen, if you're in a pit, we just want to touch and agree that the Father is pulling you up out of your mess today. Anybody.
Put your hands together for the Lord. Put your hands together for the Lord. Come on. Some of you have been in that pit. Some of you have been in that pit. And some of you know the only way to get out is to praise. Come on. Philippians 4. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Tommy told us in the beginning of the service, this is crazy. He told us in the beginning of the service, he said, your praise is prayer. It's a form of prayer. Your praise is prayer. Well, Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer or by praise and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. So sometimes it's not, I mean, I don't come to the Lord weeping, moaning, and stumbling over stuff. I come to Him with praise and thanksgiving. So I say to God, thank you for Jimmy. Thank you for the word. I was a mess in my seat. Oh, man. Thank you for Jimmy. Thank you for his ministry. God, I ask you right now in Jesus' name, everybody in agreement, bless his ministry, God. Bless his family. I thank you for his daughter and his son. That He's an example unto them, unto who you've called him to be. That they see you, God, through him. I thank you for Melinda. That she's the mom that you've created her to be, God. That her loving touch to her kids is like a touch that nobody else can fulfill. I thank you, God, as she hugs them, that she sees you. As he hugs them, they see you. God, I thank you for their family. I thank you for their ministry. I thank you he's a servant of yours. And he's proclaimed today that your praise will forever be on his lips. Thank you what you've done in this altar today, God. We give you praise for it. For if it was one of my kids, for if it was one of my kids, God, I press in for their kids. Mm. I press in for the young men. I press in for the older men. I press in for the older women, the younger women. God, we press in. For one day I might find myself in a pit. I'm looking for a handout. Today, God, I thank you for pulling them out of the pit. They'll never be there again. They'll never be there again. If they fall, they find themselves in the pit, it won't even seem like they're in the pit because they're focused on you. When the eye is full of light, the whole body is full of light. I thank you, God, that they're focused on you and their praise is a weapon. Their praise shall, your praise shall forever be on their lips. We decree that and declare that as kings and priests unto God. In Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Lord.